Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord has just come out, well, officially launched at least, and with it there are seven kingdoms for you to choose from. Whether as a mercenary or a vassal, the question always kind of crops up of which kingdom is the best. And in this video today, I'm going to help deliver that information by giving you a quick rundown of each kingdom and then concluding the video by giving you my idea of which one is quote unquote the best. Now I say that because there truly is no best kingdom. It's really a role play based game. And sure, some kingdoms do edge out amongst the others as a little bit better in some arenas or in certain scenarios. But uh, one thing I want to impress upon you before we even get started into this video is to not worry about min max what the best kingdom is just go with which whenever one you like the aesthetic of or the or the location of all of their cities and all of their castles because if you're a vassal you are going to hold territory in that domain so just go with what you enjoy the most more often more over than what is the best but we'll still go over that here for you and what we're going to do is you can jump to any part of the video that interests you the most using both the chapters in the timeline and the description and if you've not yet picked up Bannerlord you can head on over to my Nexus store and purchase Bannerlord uh, it gets give you a steed steam key directly from the developer and it is a great way to support the channel because i get a portion of every sale that as i've said goes towards my small puppy's extreme treat addiction but let's get started here on what is the best kingdom in mountain blade 2 banner lord so here we have all of colorado and all of its many kingdoms and you get to decide which one to join. Now, before we even get into that discussion, I do want to talk about being a mercenary versus being a vassal because vassal is what you will aspire to be in the game towards the, well, not even mid to late game, really kind of the late early game. You cannot become a vassal until you get a specific clan rank. I believe it's clan rank two. So with that, you are forced with becoming a mercenary first, which is not bad. So let's go ahead and I'm using a cheat console, which allows me to kind of warp around the map. Let's find a noble one right here and we're going to talk to them really quick and you have a choice here i'm going to enter the service of the sultan and my sword is yours is becoming a mercenary my lord i would pledge allegiance to you and become counted among your loyal followers is becoming a vassal remember this will be grayed out for you if you do not have the proper rank so let's go ahead and become a uh, mercenary really quick and he'll tell you your reward will be 140 for every group of enemies you vanquish or for an equivalent deed what he is saying here is he is going to pay you for your influence so let's go ahead and press i accept um it doesn't matter after that so once you are a um mercenary here if i hover over this it tells me my mercenary contract change is going to remove my influence by one every day and hovering over this it tells me i'm getting 140 gold per day based off of my influence so this number here if it's at zero i just get no money because i'm not doing anything in the service of the kingdom i've signed up for um mercenary of <laughs> um don't mind me just changing something really quick in the background but so what you want to do is as a mercenary is you want to use that as a chance to go ahead and um go and do deeds go do quests go do whatever that earns you influence mainly attacking the enemy raiding their villages joining armies sieging castles whatever it is but the question is can i just leave the kingdom as a mercenary without any penalties yes you can and you should because when you get uh, when you become a mercenary, you have access to the kingdom tab, which is K on your keyboard. I don't know what it is on console. I apologize. And you press diplomacy. This gives you the total strength of every single nation, as well as their diplomatic standing with other nations. So let's take a look at the Kazait. They have 4,900, let's just say 5,000 total strength. And they're currently, the symbol means at war, with the Northern Empire. Well, let's look at the Northern Empire. Well, they have 5,100. Technically, if I were to leave the kingdom of the Asari, which is only offering me 140 gold a day, I could go become a uh, mercenary of the Kazate, who would pay me more money to be a mercenary for them. Uh, same thing here with the Western Empire. They have, they have 4,800. They're going to pay me more money than the Asari, but the Batanians have 5,000. They are not going to pay me more money. Uh, Sturgia versus Volandia, Sturgia would pay me more. So use this screen to be a dynamic 
mercenary. Don't just stay with one kingdom. It's not going to earn you any more relationship than just simply going out to other kingdoms and going and taking advantage of making the most money you can as a mercenary. And as a quick tip, always make sure you free any noble you capture after battle because it will increase your standing with them. So then when you decide to become a vassal, you'll have high standing with those people and it makes it a lot easier for you. When you're a vassal, you'll take advantage of fiefs, policies, stuff like that, because you can actually use your influence. It's no longer a means to produce money for you. It's a means to produce, well, influence. You can use it for voting on policies, whether or not you're going to war or going to have peace. You can vote for the ownership of a fiefdom after it is recently captured, so a castle or a city. That's your big difference between vassalage and mercenaries, and I wanted to make that distinction up front before we went into it. The first kingdom I want to talk about is Volandia, and it's probably my favorite one. All the kingdoms we're about to talk about right now are in no specific order. I will give you my concluding thoughts on which is quote unquote the best at the end um, in its own separate section. So let's go ahead and take a look here with Volandia um, and, and where it is in the map too. It's in the far western portion of the map, so it has that advantage of just being kind of like a non-central powerhouse, and that it doesn't need to worry about uh, a front over there. But if we, the real thing we're going to kind of take a look at here is the military for Volandia and for all the respective uh, units here. So Volandia is led by King Durthert and we have the Volandian recruit. Volandia has a really cool military in that its base military has a very strong top tier cav unit or cavalry, I just say cav for short, in the Volandian Vanguard. It's a very good, very nice shock cavalry unit that will get the job done, trust me. And it has one of the strongest, if not one of the best, infantry units in the Volandian Sergeant. He has great one-handed skill, he has a throwing weapon, he's got a pole arm. Um, I think he had some of iterations... Now, he used to have a two-handed weapon, which allowed him to have a lot of cool threat range. But he has a sword a mace or an axe depending on which of these three sets you get the sets are random and they get sharpshooters which are uh crossbow soldiers crossbowmen are very good in mass but very poor in small quantities if you have like 10 10 archers are better because they shoot at a faster rate but if you have 50 they just crush things because they have such a good amount of damage that they can dish out. And they have a lot of really good defensive capabilities because of their armor and because of their big, huge pad of shields. But another thing that Volandia gets that most factions don't is a dedicated pikeman. Now, this pike has a 20, 222 weapon length, meaning they will actually brace it against the ground to hit people and destroy them. So if you have a big cavalry charge coming, putting pikemen in the front line can actually absorb the charge from Kazate or from Sturgeon or Druznik. They're very, very strong. So Volandia's military is strong with cavalry, Decent enough with range. I, I, I say the decent because you need them in mass. They're very good, but you just need them in mass. Their infantry is a little lackluster until you get up to tier four. The veteran swordsman is quite good, but that's the kind of the the, the bad thing about Volandia. Tier everything up to tier three is mediocre at best. It doesn't have great skills, doesn't have great armor or armament, but once you get into tier four, you start to get into a little bit better of a rotation of things, and that is quite nice. This all, though, culminates with the best unit, the best cavalry unit in the game with the Volandian Banner Knight. I find it to be the best personally. It has amazing polearm skill at 260, uh, 220 one-handed, and 200 riding. It has, it does what it is supposed to do better than most other um, competing characters in its class. Saying, for example, the Elite Cataphract here. That is a helicopter going by my house. Don't mind the helicopter who has very similar stat lines, but loses out on 20 one-handed. So I personally prefer the shock capabilities of the Banner Knight versus the Cataphract. But when we talk about the Empire, I will talk about why that Cataphract is very good. Just know that with Volandia, this is considered the noble line. Every single kingdom has its own special noble line, which is a single straight line like this. It doesn't have a big branch like the other ones do. And that line is the kind of the, the best of the best of that nation 
because it goes to a higher tier at tier six and its skills can become way higher than any other uh, matching tier five counterpart in other nations. So that concludes our Volandia. Let's move into our next kingdom. That next kingdom is Sturgia. Vlandia, I think, is probably the one that most people play for the first time, right? Because they're like, oh, it's knights, shining armor, all those fun things. But Sturgia, I think, kind of fits that niche of what people would think of when they're thinking of Vikings. It follows the more Slavic, Kievan Rus style of the early Middle Ages of armament and um, aesthetics, but it is still really cool. And Sturgia, too, is placed all the way to the northern portion of the map. Sturgia has had a very wild history from the beginning of early access all the way up to now the launch of the game and it went from being a joke of a nation that just always got steamrolled by everyone else to now a very competitive strong powerhouse and their tried and true strength is in their infantry so let's take a look here go ahead and go type in Sturg Sturgian recruit and we see the Sturgian military so the right side of the Sturgian military has archers with the hunter into the archer into the uh, veteran bowman I'm not even going to sugarcoat it. They're all not good. They're really just mediocre. Even the veteran bowmen. Uh, they have had uh, upgrades to their uh, items and their bows and their arrows and everything. But they're still just not good. You're better off pulling almost any other archer into your army. Because their bow here, the Nordic short bow, is a very crappy tier 3 bow. I would avoid it at all costs. But they get horse raiders, which are very good Throw, uh, throwing cavalry soldiers that you can have just kind of riding things down. The bread and butter of the military is their heavy spearmen, which are very good with good uh, fine steel spears. You can't brace them on the ground, but they're very good spears nonetheless. They've got a great stat range here of 140 one-handed, 140 polearm with 125 athletics. And the heavy axemen, which are very, very good as well with some good throwing skill to um, rather than polearm so they can throw these uh, throwing axes quite well. Putting these two together is very strong. You have a very, you have like almost an impregnable shield wall. And you can also take advantage of really cool soldiers in the heroic line breaker and the line breaker, which used to be called berserkers. Um, it's worth noting that with the AI of Sturgia, they will try to push out and fight with Volandia a lot. And Volandia will fight with Sturgia a lot. I forgot to mention this with the AI. And the AI for Volandia is very aggressive, whereas Sturgia's is a little bit more passive or at least defensive. So it's kind of worth noting those things. If you're playing as a nation, you kind of want to play a more fast, hard-hitting nation. Volandia is super aggressive, whereas Sturgia is not. And I'm not going to talk so much about the actual cultural bonuses. I've talked about those in their own character creation video. You can go ahead and find those linked in the upper right corner to all of my guides. and plenty, plenty, plenty of guides for you to check out. So go ahead and check them out. But I think really what you're going to be enjoying here with Sturgia is an infantry kind of play style. I think that playing the game on foot, even though it's called Mount and Blade, is one of the most rewarding experiences. And with Sturgia and Batania, you really get a strong line to support that on foot play. With Heavy Spearmen and Axemen, you are not going to be left in the lurch. Now, the um, Noble line for Sturgia starts on foot. With the Varyag to the Varyag Veteran, up to the Druznik uh, to the Druznik Champion. And the Druznik Champion is now really damn good. It did not used to be, but it's got good riding at 170, great athletics at 140, good one-handed one at 200, and uh, pull on at 170. It definitely has a wider set of uh, skills. And what makes them very good compared to, say, the Elite Cataphract or the Banner Knight is that when you do a siege and they're not on horseback, their athletic skill kind of saves the day and it keeps them very strong and competitive. You can dismount them in the middle of a fight and have them be really strong soldiers that you've used to push behind the back line. Here's a real cool way to use them. You get a whole mess of these guys, you put them in a special group, let's just say group three, four, five, whatever it is, and you target behind the enemy lines. You have them run all the way back there while your main force engages. And then you have them charge and then you have them dismount and then they can just jump right in and start fighting everyone or you just keep them on horseback and have charge the back line like you would any other normal cavalry but my point is though that even as cavalry they're very very good on foot if their horse gets killed out from underneath them whereas most cavalry do not benefit from high athletics I mean they'll be very slow and hard to move around so 
If you want to play that tried and true strong infantry army, then Sturgia is going to be the one for you. Moving into probably the smallest of the nations, we have Batania. And it is by no means a weak nation. It is quite mighty. Having some of the best archers in the game, um, especially when it comes to the noble line, right, with the Fian. So let's take a look at the Batanians. It is worth noting, too, their, uh, their kind of AI profile is a little messy. They're going to deal with a lot of aggression here from the Western Empire. They might get into some wars with Volandia, and they'll get into some wars with uh, Sturgia. And it's worth noting, this is our first kingdom that is centrally located. So, centrally located in the sense that they're surrounded on all sides by uh, possible opposing nations. So because there's no actual diplomacy in this game, uh, uh, as far as like alliances, just keep that in mind. You might be fighting wars on multiple fronts and holding your fiefs, your castles, your cities, whatever, might be a little more challenging for you. This might be a much harder playthrough just to kind of give you a little bit of a heads up. But even though I said, hey, I'm not going to talk about the, uh, <laughs> the, um, the what's it called the cultural bonus the batanian cultural bonus is amazing <laughs> it's the best one in my opinion the, the bonus towards moving through forests is so huge because you move through so many forests in this game so when you look at batania you get a pretty wild range of things for one there are no um ranged units in the standard military you'll only get that from your noble line that is unique that is very wild. Your volunteers and your clan warriors are very paper thin. They're very, very easy to kill. And the Woodrunner is as well. But as soon as you jump into tier three, unlike Volandia, right, which took tier four to really start get going, um, you start to get very good units. The trained warrior is very nice. The picked or sometimes pickled, depending on if you have dyslexia and read it wrong like I do. I don't have dyslexia, but I read it like an idiot. Um, starts to get very good. Uh, great athletics, good one-handed, good polearm. And then once you get into the Oath Sworn, you get a character that kind of acts almost like a Roman legionnaire in athletics, one-handed throwing and polearm because they have all three they can take advantage of. They've got a throwing axe, they've got a one-handed bearded axe, and they've got a tipped hook spear, which is braceable, meaning you can take a charge head-on with them. Another thing, though, is they get amazing skirmish units, probably some of the best. If you take a look at the skirmisher, into the veteran skirmisher, into the wildling. And now a skirmisher unit is someone who, yes, they are, they do have melee capabilities, but their focus is on using throwing weapons. You'd keep them more on a flank, throwing down into your enemy, not up in the front, not in the rear, because they can't throw, well, they can throw over, but it's not going to be as, as um, well, not as useful. And with the Wildling, you also have the Falksman. The Falks is a huge polearm, 203 length. And the best way to kind of use these guys in conjunction is using them to flank the left and the right sides. And if Sturgia, playing on foot with Sturgia is really good, playing on foot with Batania is even better. It's probably one of my favorite playthroughs is to play a character on foot using a two-handed weapon and a bow. It's, again, a game called Mountain Blade. You wouldn't think it's that cool, but it's really that cool. And if you want, you can use some mounted skirmishers, which aren't great. I'm not going to lie to you. They're not amazing units. You get much better units of mounted skirmishers. You're better off going with the Wildling, who for the longest time was better than the Oath Sworn. Because if you look at this, you're getting 121 handed versus the Oath Sworn only having 130, so 10 more. And you're getting 130 throwing. So they can take advantage of using those throwing weapons. Um, but the Oath Sworn now has good throwing, polearm, one-handed, and athletics. So that kind of matches out above it. So using them in conjunction, you could even keep them in the front line with your Oath Sworn and just mix the unit together. And they'll throw their throwing weapons as the enemy approaches them in range. So you have a lot of really great use cases with the Wildling. Same thing with the Falksman, using them on the flank and having them just trying to chop things down is great. But the hero of the day for Batania is the Fian. The Fian into the Fian Champion is one of the best units in the game. 220 two-handed, 260 bow, and with a woodland longbow, it is the best archer in the game, both offensively and defensively. If you have these guys lining the wall of a castle, someone comes up those... those uh, ladders or into a siege tower they're going to get hacked apart with this massive two-handed highland fine two-handed sword 
it's just going to cut things down. They're so cool in mass. And with 170 athletics too, they're going to have, they're, they're track stars. They'll be hunting people down. They are terrors in the night. They are some of my favorite units in the game and modeling your character after them. Like I said, is one of my favorite playthrough styles in the game. So if you want to play a character on foot with a very good, strong, Noble, keep in mind this is a noble line, meaning only certain places in the game will have it recruitable. Um, for example, this place is almost always has, in fact, we'll even take a look right now. Like one of these has almost ha always has a, oh, yep, those are Fians. These are the base form of the Fian, the highborn youth. And I think this one does too. And getting those Fians online, even if you're not playing, the, not even playing Batania, they're just such strong, good units. But if you want that kind of uh, on foot style, then it is going to be the one for you. I didn't even touch on their horsemen because their horsemen are terrible. <laughs> it's just not even worth it to go into. You're, you're, you're playing with infantry when you're playing with Batania. So worth bringing all those things up. Let's move on to our another kingdom. Since we talked about the kingdom that's best on foot, let's talk about the kingdom that's best on horseback with Kazate. Now, these are the horse lords modeled after Hunnic tribes, right? And... um of the steps, so you get some pretty wild characters here. I think Nomad, because uh, Nomad is our first character. So with this, what I really like about the Kazadi military is that it is broken down very easily. You're either gonna go with your Nomad, which is a terrible tier one troop, but it's a tier one troop, so who cares, into tribal warriors, which are on horseback with some mild melee capabilities, but mainly being ranged into either a pure range focus or a pure melee focus and then you can choose either to go uh, or you can go into a footman why did i say it like that a footman who can then go into pure ranged or pure melee again i really like this kind of split here and with the military you get actually amazing units in all four of these categories the horse archer is very strong very, very strong with good 130 one-handed, which I wish would be swapped with. Oh, no, the bow is 130. Never mind. Uh, 130 bow, 130 riding, 130 one-handed. So they actually can threaten things that, that do attack them. They have great armor. Like the mirrored brigandine armor is some of the best armor that you can actually get. The Kazate Heavy Lancer is an amazing shock cav unit with 150 riding, meaning they'll be going very, very quick, and they'll have some good resistance to being dismounted. Good pole arm and good one-handed as well here. They don't have throwing weapons, but that's okay. That's not their niche. Into the Marksman, which is, again, a very good archer because it has a good bow with a step recurve bow, um, not to be confused with your step bro, and cured leather lamellar armor for archers that's actually pretty good defensive capability with step arrows which are good good stack amount there's 40 i'm sorry there's uh, yeah 48 total uh arrows with these guys they're really strong and then the kazate darken is another really great unit it's got 130 polearm one-handed and athletics with its uh, good spear not braceable but a good uh, okay shield and a great saber like there is the the kazate military is perfect in my mind it is perfect it has got it is great in everything it does um it's worth noting that these are only spear infantry so you don't get anyone that's kind of focused in two-handed weapons or any kind of flanking throwing weapons or anything like that they used to in times past but not anymore they are purely spear infantry these are purely archers purely dudes on horseback using a pole arm so it's worth noting that there is no kind of bifurcation across different units or any kind of hybrid hybridizing in these. They are tried and true, just pure specific uh, focuses, which I think is a, honestly a lot easier to take advantage of. If you've watched my beginner guide video, um, sorry, my beginner build video, I said the, be the best beginner build in the game is a horse archer. And you can just slot right into the horse archers in your Kazate military very, very easily. So with that, you get your noble line of the cons guard, your noble son that goes all the way down to your cons guard, which is a really great unit because they get glaives, which are super strong, step recurve bows, which are also really great, and they have a great, great amount of skills. 260 bow, 200 riding, 220 polearm. Who rivaled that bow was Fian, and they were on foot. So the Kazate cons guard is, is a force to be reckoned with. Doesn't have a shield or a one-handed weapon, so they're really only great in field battles they're okay in sieges so you have to kind of keep that thing in mind but when you are playing kazate you'll be dealing with a lot of wars and aggression with the northern and the southern empire that's pretty much who you're going to be fighting with and with that in mind you play a very aggressive faction 
but fighting any kind of actual siege is a lot harder for you. You want to force those open field battles because that's where your units can take advantage of their horses. Sieges, they obviously cannot. So if you want a gameplay that's kind of geared more towards open field battles and less towards sieges and playing with a lot of horseplay, like a, like a horseplay, that's weird, a lot like Riders of Rohan style, then you want to play as the Kazate. Moving all the way to the south, we have the Southern Lords in the Asserai. And these characters, I think, this is, a, this is both a nation and a military that I think is often slept on as being uninteresting or maybe underpowered, whatever it is. Because at one point in the early access portion of the game, it really, really, really was. It was painful, it was boring, it was hard to play in. But since then, that has changed. Located all the way on the southern portion of the map, you really only have three main access ways into your territory. Over here, this little straight. Over here, these two little pieces of land. And then, like, well, I guess there's like a fourth one, that bridge right there. That's it. So it's kind of easy to defend either through Huss and Folk or through uh, Koyaz. I mean, the AI will bypass them if they so wish. But it's kind of nice that if you want to be a vassal in a kingdom, it's nice that if you have, like, something down here in your hinterlands, you know it's relatively safe, which is nice because if you have caravans and workshops and stuff like that, losing them is going to be a little bit harder for you, which is, again, very, very, very nice. Let's take a look over here at uh, what I'm looking for, Azurai. So our Azurai recruit um, has gotten better, but it is still probably one of the worst tier one soldiers in the game. Uh, very low armor, so expect these guys to get killed in droves. But then the Azurai recruit splits off into a tribesman and a Mamluk soldier. And from there, you get some interesting kind of dynamic changes. The Mamluk soldier is a character that has a polearm. Very interesting, very nice. And the military gets really weird until you get to the third tier. The third tier is where it really starts to pop off. Um, the Axeman into the, uh, into the Mamluk Guard, into the Palace Guard are very devastating two-handed uh, weapon shock units. Again, you would use these guys on a flank outside of your, your standard military uh, infantry block. You can put them in the infantry block, but it's the best way to really use them is on that flank and having them flank into the unprotected portion of the enemy army because they'll rip through things. Your regular goes from being a polearm wielding cavalry unit into horse archers. Now, the Mamluk Heavy Cav is one of the best horse archer units in the game. It has a very devastating bow and the step recurve bow. It used to have a heavy recurve bow, which is which was the best. And it's got great piercing arrows. It's got a good fine steel long cascara, which is a very, very good um, long one-handed weapon and a, a pretty good shield. It's got great stats too at 130, 130, 130 on bow, riding, and one-handed. So all the things that it takes advantage of, it's good. And good athletics at 80. So even on, on foot, it can still compete pretty well if you do any kind of sieges. It's a really, really, really good unit that I think that a lot of people bypass in the Azerian military. Now going to the tribesman portion of this, we go into the light archer, uh, which is good. It did not used to have an archer here. It used to be a skirmish style unit that he was using throwing weapons. But the light archer into the archer into the master archer. Now the master archer is the second best archer in the game outside of the Batanian Fian. 160 bow. You also are looking at a step recurve bow, which is a strong bow with two stacks of piercing arrows. It is as far as archers go. The second best one next to the Fian. And that is that's saying something. Into the or onto the Azerian veteran infantry. We get 130 athletics, 160 one-handed, and 130 polearm. With a really great set of uh, 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 accoutrement here with a throwing weapon too, with the horseman javelin and a fine steel leaf spear. It is a great all-rounder style of infantry unit that can has a great threat range. It can throw weapons, it can use a polearm against cavalry, it's got that sword that can just chop apart other infantry. It is again a very, very solid infantry unit with great defensive capabilities and light lamellar armor, as well as reinforced mittens and splint boots. It's just, again, a great set of um military units that take a long time to come online but once they do they really pop off so the noble line here for your uh azurai is the azurai ferris or vanguard ferris and this is basically a polearm one-handed throwing powerhouse they have the most throwing of any 
Oh, 140? That, that used to be a higher number. Well, 200 pole arm, 140 throwing. So throw out my, my throwing uh, statement. 170 one-handed and 170 riding. These guys can just rip things up because they're throwing jarids, which are really strong. 121 pierce damage. They can just rip things apart <clears throat> in open field battles. They're going to be good because they also have a shield, right, in uh, sieges. But getting those throwing weapons online in a in a uh, uh, field battle, it really brings these guys to bear. But they also still have a great weapon, a great amount of armor here. Luxury scale armor gives them a ton of stability. And I think that their use case across multiple kind of facets of being cavalry makes them a lot stronger than, say, a cataphract, which is just simply uh, a really good shot cap. But, I mean, I still think I'd put... The cataphract above the ferris i just still like i like how the ferris can do more stuff so if you want to kind of play more of a <clears throat> skirmish style because asrai is all about trying to use choke points trying to use as much as you of the terrain as you can against your enemy because open field battles for them until they get into their latter portions of their military is a little tough you need to kind of use the fact that you've got these two mobile cavalry platforms or your really good archers and really good ferrises with their mobility to your advantage. You need to use choke points to kind of hold that line while your archers and horse archers and, and cav take things apart. If you want that play style, then you will really enjoy playing as the Azerai. And the Azerai too have become in more recent patches very aggressive towards the Western Empire, Empire, but mainly play a defensive game against both portions of the Empire um, as they invade from the northern portions of the realm. And now we conclude with the largest swath of land dedicated to what is arguably the protagonist, maybe antagonist depending on how you side in the campaign, in the Empire. Now the Empire is split up across the Southern Empire, which is kind of like the true empire. That's where the uh, the descendant of the empire is. The Western Empire, which is all led by the former generals of the, em of the, of the United Empire. And the Northern Empire, which I think is the largest of the two. I don't know. And with that, they all benefit from the same exact troops. It doesn't really matter. Um, you're just choosing a different color, basically. But looking at the Imperial Recruit, it's, it is whatever. What you do is, though, you jump into either infantry or archers. And there are no cavalry in the baseline for um, Imperials. Which is okay because their noble line is very devastating. Very devastating. Their infantry soldier gets pretty good fast in the trained infantrymen because it gets access to javelins then into the veteran infantryman which loses a javelin gets a pilum and then goes into the legionary which loses throwing capabilities pretty much all together with just a single shot pilum which you want to you basically sh you shut off you turn off fire at will and they'll always use the pilum to as a pole arm rather than actually throwing it <clears throat> which is better because that way they've got a better threat range into cav what is the big thing, though, with the Imperials is amongst all the other factions, like Volandia has their knights, Sturgia has their shield walls and their infantry, Batania has that core strong infantry with a bunch of wild stuff, right? And their and their throwing capabilities because they'd have their horses. Azrai have um, a lot of mobility and whatnot, but the Imperials have armor, lots of it. Lots and lots and lots of it. The defensive and health capabilities of the Imperials are where their fighting strength is. They might not do the most damage uh, through their armor or through skill sets, but they will always outlast the competition because they just have such heavy armor. And with the changes made to armor, they really can take advantage of that. Now, the Elite Manavliaton uh, has gotten better in more recent patches, but this is a two-handed shock troop that basically uses this huge Manavliaton to rip things, uh, Manavlion, sorry, uh, with 160 weapon length to just kind of rip things apart. Again, use these on the flank. You can keep them with your army, but they can get a little jammed up with how long this thing's length is, so use them on a flank to try to get the most out of them as you can. For the archers, you actually get some pretty interesting things. This is the only army that has the choice to go enter into a very good archer. Uh, these guys have 140 bow. I think they come in at third place as far as archers go with a very good step war bow and good bodkin arrows, which great pierce and everything here. But they can also go into crossbowmen. So you can actually have really good archers until you get so many that you just jump into some crossbowmen and then maybe sub out for entirely crossbowmen or do 50 50 split you've got a different kind of threat range and 
you can jump into a Busolarii to get access to some horse archers if you so want them in your army. It's what makes the Imperials so cool is that they have a very diverse military, touching on pretty much everything except for a dedicated throwing uh, unit. They've got crossbows, they've got archers, they got horse archers. You were going to see the shock cabin a little bit. They got shock infantry and they have a really strong hold the line style infantry. So it's really, really nice. I don't think that these guys, yeah. The cool thing too about them is that the legionaries get these maces and maces are great because they maintain blunt damage into the later game. So as a tier five unit, these guys can threaten into other tier five heavily armored units better because of that blunt damage. Moving into the cataphract, we get, you saw these guys earlier, the heaviest armored unit on horseback. 200 riding, 200 one-handed, 260 pole arm. These guys, of course, can are shock cab style units, just like Banner Knights and the such, but they're arguably the best cab in the game because of their survivability. They've got a really good big shield in the Knight's Kite Shield. They've got a Corsair Lance, which is a huge, long, 225 weapon length, couchable lance. Um, well, braceable, sorry, braceable. Uh, Fine Seal Paramirian, which is a really great long weapon. And they just have a ton of armor on them, man. Like, look at this. 57 body armor on that. 52 head armor on that. Like, they're just, they, they really have a lot of great stability. They even have it in the cataphract level, which is tier five. So if you want to play a very diverse military that has the ability to go in whatever direction you want and you kind of choose, right? Do I want to be part of the Southern Empire and kind of take advantage over this or the Western Empire and go over here or Northern Empire and go over here? You kind of a little bit more of a pick and play, uh, pick and choose for your military. So uh, military or your conquests in the game. And that kind of summarizes uh, the empire as well as all of our kingdoms. So the ultimate question here is, what is the best kingdom to play in Mountain Blade 2 Bannerlord? This is a trick because there's not really one best kingdom. And I said that earlier in the video anyway. But I, this is kind of a three-way tie here for me. And it's between three, and it's for three different reasons. I would choose, if I'm purely thinking about how I want to play the game and my kind of influence in the actual characters I'm playing with, I give it to Kazate. Because it, in my opinion, has one of the strongest, if not the best, militaries as far as its diversity, the ability to threaten into everything, and the cons guard is absolutely amazing. It's really strong, and if you are playing a horse archer as well, Kazate is just so good. But, on the other hand, Volandia has a really good AI profile. They expand out from their homeland very well. They take really close castles and cities, and they seem to always be a faction that expands out very quickly, or at least strong enough that they stay and maintain their lands. Um, I always see uh, places kind of come and go in other nations, but Volandia always has a really good presence on the map, and they have a very good and fun military as well. The Volandian Banner Knight, of course, is one of my favorite units in the game but the volandian sergeant in my opinion is the strongest single uh, uh infantry soldier in the game and i i, I don't know it, it's changed so much in, in the years um but i just really like the what they can offer across pole arm shield uh their their repertoire of weapons they're really really good in the military too once it really once you get into the top tiers of the military i find it to be very very good so those are the big two ties that i've got across the military and the AI's profile for play and your play style, right? Like I think that that Kazate really fits a lot of people jumping into the horse archer range and it just it just kicks so well. But the third place that I just kind of want to talk about is the Empire. The Empire's cultural bonus to loot not having a, um, a, lo blah, 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 a loyalty penalty um, when having a different culture when taking a fife is, is huge because if you look across here, the majority of these um, cities that you're going to be taking are empire. So you don't lose any loyalty for taking um, non-empire locations like you would if you did anywhere else. And on top of it, you can get the leadership perk presence, which allows it so that you lose no morale for recruiting empire prisoners. So those are that, that's kind of like a big brain. I already understand the game really well. Let me just jump into like kind of a, a best playthrough in that scenario. Then play the empire. If you're brand new to the game and want to run things down with horses, 
play Kazate. If you want to play a little bit slower pace, but you're also still kind of new, or you're maybe a returning veteran, and you want to really enjoy some strong playthrough, play as Volandia. I think that both Sturgia and Aserai are very good and very strong, but it requires you as the player to have a better knowledge of the game, to maybe better influence certain votes or influence certain growth or attack and wars. So I think it, you need to be more engaged with game mechanics on, the, on those two kingdoms that I think that because uh, it's like kind of playing autopilot <laughs> whereas the other ones are you have to play a lot more manual so hopefully that helps you out in deciding what is the next nation you want to play through and as, as either a vassal or a mercenary in mountain blade 2 bannerlord and if you're just coming to the game and you have any questions please by all means go ahead and let me know in the comment section below i have a ton of videos linked at the end of this to my guide playlist go ahead and check that out and as always guys thank you so much for watching here today have a good one and take care